All right, welcome back everyone to another session of farm management during uncertain times. On our panel today, we have two farm management area specialists that have learned this job over the years and they are very well versed in this area and we're very happy to have them with us. The first one is Alan Galloway. He is located in Middle Tennessee and not only is he a farm management area specialist, but he's also our Agricultural Income Tax Program Coordinator. So we're very happy to have him on this session. Then we also have Kevin Ferguson. He's also located in Middle Tennessee and he is our State Manage Program Coordinator. So to kind of get us started on this topic and where we're going, today's topic is tax implications and lender relationships. And there's no surprise with the rising input costs and expenses that we have seen over this last year a lot of people have really started considering selling pieces of equipment or potentially some of their breeding livestock in the herd to get some of that extra cash to pay for things as certain bills come up. But when we decide to sell this equipment that we may not be fully utilizing on the farm or sell some of that livestock, there are certain things that come up with that has tax implications that we always have to think about. And so, Alan, to kind of get us started on this, we want to talk about how should the sales of equipment or livestock be reported on a farm tax return? Oh, thank you, Tori. And that is a good question because, unfortunately, a lot of times there are some errors made in that area, uh, uh, either by the farmer reporting it to their tax preparer or by the tax preparers themselves not fully understanding the rules. Uh, when it comes to equipment itself, that one's pretty straightforward. There's a special form for IRS sales uh, of equipment, Form 4797, that it's a sale of business property form. And pretty much any used equipment that we've decided to sell off the farm, that gets reported there. That one's pretty straightforward. The one that confuses folks the most is the livestock sales. And it becomes especially important if we're selling off part of our breeding herd. So if we've, and it doesn't matter if it's cattle or hogs or sheep or what it is, if you're removing cull uh, females or cull bulls or, or, or rams or whatever it may be from the herd, they're often mistakenly reported on Schedule F. And that income of breeding livestock doesn't go on Schedule F. It goes on the same form as the equipment sales, that Form 4797. Now, there's a few picky little rules to it. Number one, to qualify for the full benefit, you might say, the breeding livestock has to be held in the case of cattle and horses for at least have to be owned by 20, by, for 24 months. Uh, in the case of other livestock, uh, sheep, goats, uh, that sort of thing, uh, it's at least 12 months they have to be owned and then they, they qualify for that form 4797, which may put them into the classification of a capital gain or loss. And that way, the key thing here is it prevents the farmer having to pay self-employment tax on that sale. And self-employment tax can be 15.3%, that alone. And if you report it incorrectly and put those breeding livestock sales on Schedule F, you may also be penalizing yourself by paying regular income tax, ordinary income tax on that sale, rather than it being listed as a capital gains or loss type sale. So it's it's really important that, that farmers remember on all those equipment sales and breeding livestock that it goes on that other form. Now, if they're selling calves or if they're in the business of raising breeding livestock or they're raising replacement bulls or replacement heifers, then those would go on Schedule F uh, because they're not part of their breeding herd. But if it's part of their breeding herd that they're selling off, then it, it could make a big difference on the taxes before it's over. So it seems that the selling of equipment, that's pretty straightforward with that. The Schedule 47, not Form 4797 right. instead of the Schedule F. But mm -hmm. I kind of want to hit some more on that livestock side there for these that are having to cull or mm -hmm. maybe destock on their land mm -hmm. right now. So. If they every year they decide to cull a few from their herd to improve genetics, to improve efficiency, what happens if they have to cull additional livestock than what they normally do due to a disaster or drought? Is that income reported differently? It can be. And we've got some advantages there that could be really important that could save them some tax dollars. Uh, if if they sell additional livestock, and let me give a quick example. Let's say that a, a small operation normally culls out 10 of their older cows from their herd. That's just kind of their average each year. They cull out about 10 cows. But this year, due to the drought, they've decided to cull out 15. 
those additional five that they've called out due to drought or severe weather or disaster, that sort of thing, they can postpone reporting that gain for up to two years if it's due to what they call, the IRS calls a weather-related event or a weather-related situation. And so they can, they don't even have to put that income of those additional ones that they sold even on their tax return. They technically should put it on there, but then show it as not you know, basically counted as income because they're because they're going to replace those. They've got two years to replace those livestock due to that weather related event. Then if the area or that county or the surrounding county is designated as a extreme or severe drought area by the IRS through the report that comes out every year, then that two years could extend to four years. Now the key thing is when they replace those additional heifers that say that they culled out or old cows and they buy some new heifers to replace them with if what they buy costs less money then they may have to report the difference as income if the new replacements cost more then obviously you don't you don't have a you know, any back reporting to do now if they never replace them then they may have to go back and amend that old return and and show that as income in in, in the you know from the year that they sold them but, uh, you know, odds are most folks are, are probably going to go back in at some point. It just may be delayed because of the weather event. But, yeah, there are some definite advantages if we end up with weather, additional uh, breeding livestock we've got rid of because of the of weather-related events. And just to make sure on that, that in order for this to be the case, that the county or area has to be designated that it's been impacted by drought or disaster, correct, by IRS? Well, to qualify for that additional time period, it has to be, yeah, each September, the IRS puts out a list of counties of each state that is designated as a severe extreme drought county for that previous 12 months. Uh, and so that that's what extends the period. But usually uh, the weather related event, it's got some flexibility in it where in most cases you can show that as a, you know, it, that it doesn't always have to be designated as such. I think one thing and just touch on this, Alan, that it's back to the importance of, of record keeping and keeping breeding stock sales separate from calf sales from that or any equipment sales as well, but assets. But it's kind of leads into the deal that, you know, it's the importance. Always we know if there's any programs with FSA, Farm Service Agency, whether they're drought related, typically what they're looking for is really good sales regarding or really good numbers regarding sales or inventory. Mm -hmm. So that's the things to focus on when you're having to make these decisions and keep the records for tax purposes as well. Absolutely. And just in case they come out with a new federal program that provide might provide some disaster type payments, those records could really come into play then as well. So yeah, you could not only save on the taxes, but it might qualify you for some extra money if it happens to come along. And I think you both just hit on that next question that I had of how important was is it to keep track and have those adequate records of our sales and expenses. Mm -hmm. But since you both do it, do either of any of y'all want to add to that at this moment or Y'all answered the next question, so I kind of want to shift gears unless y'all want to add something to that. Are y'all good? That's okay. Good. Y'all answered the question, so that was perfect. That was the next thing that I wanted to ask about how important it was to keep these records. But shifting these gears and going back to this discussion of rising inflation and handling the increase in input costs, you know, we're trying to make sure that the cash flow is there when things are coming due and we're trying to sell some of this underutilized equipment. So we've got to make sure as we talked about having those adequate records to work with our tax preparers and help them help us. Who else should we be bringing into this conversation when money is a little bit tighter right now? And I want to ask Kevin this question first. Who should we really be bringing into this conversation as well besides just the tax preparers and our business? Well, and I think that's a good lead in, Tori, to, you know, we talked about here lender relationships, but I would extend that to having that good relationship with your input suppliers as well, wherever you're carrying an open account or something like that. And, you know, we talk about during the good times, it seems like the relationship is kind of, or it's more a transitional relationship where that, you know, we just communicate with each other from email, uh, things are renewed automatically and everything's going well, may not even contact and have personal contact with uh, those 
lenders or someone with farm supply business as much in the finance side. But things when things get a little tight, that's when we need to go back and have really good communication with those folks. Mm -hmm. Make sure they understand, you know, where it, where you may be facing some financial shortcomings or anything like that. Make sure that you communicate with them. One thing also is make sure that you let them know how you prefer to be contacted if you're having a discussion from payments or things like that. And the one thing, if you want to impress those lenders or those folks that's looking at the finances from the ag supply deal, have a really good up-to-date balance sheet. Mm -hmm. that knows when your payments are due and how much payments are due. And it can be either a balance sheet or, as you mentioned earlier, cash flow. And, you know, I think the thing, uh, the other thing to always remember, if you're talking to that lender or finance person, make sure you understand their lingo. <laughs> If they get to talking in ratios and where you need to pay or what, make sure you understand what they're talking about and when you need to talk about it. They're talking about your financial situation, but make sure you understand their lingo and 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 don't surprise them. Uh, we've gone through tough times before, but if it looks like you're going to have a tough time making a payment, reach out to them, talk to them in advance. Don't wait till the last moment and say, I can't make a payment now. I think there's much better ways than historically of working the way through situations like this if you keep that lender informed and have a good communication between the two of them. Alan, you've seen it. You can add to that. I, I, I just said you have to say ditto pretty much, Kevin. You're exactly right. Nobody nobody likes major surprises, and our lenders are amongst those. I mean, when when you can kind of keep them abreast of where you are and and say, okay, guys, this is it's going to be tough this fall. I can't make full payments, or I can do this, or I can't do that. Uh, they're going to be a whole lot more able to at least try to work with you. Uh, and and most of them want to they want to keep your business too. I mean, that's that's their that's their livelihood. So they're hoping to work things out as best they can. So most of them are willing to bend over backwards as best they can following their own rules. But like you say, the, if, as long as you can keep them up to date, it's, it, life should go on a lot better as best it can. And, and I know we have, and hopefully a, a tool to help the folks that may not have or to keep an up-to-date balance sheet. We're working on a spreadsheet version of a new balance sheet that's going to be simplified that it will be available on the center website where these recordings are. Hopefully we'll have that finished as well, too. That'll be a good tool to help someone with that standpoint. But I would just echo what Alan said. You know, the the whole thing, it's better to inform them up front. Mm -hmm. You possibly will have more options as well by talking with them the earlier you talk to them during some financial situations than later. Mm -hmm. So and you know, there's two things that I think of that both of y'all were talking right there. And the first one that Kevin said, understand the language when they're talking, the ratios they're using. But something else that I would go with that is that if they do say something about a ratio, ask them what it means. Don't sit there and yeah. act like you know what they're saying. They're not going to they're not going to be upset if you go, OK, explain what you're looking at. This has to deal with my operation. Tell me what we're looking at here. They'd much rather see that. Yeah, where do those numbers come from sometimes yep. that they're calculating that by? Is it, is it good to know? Even if you don't maybe do the research beforehand on what mm -hmm. that language is, when they're talking to you, ask them what those numbers mean and how they're getting them. You just touched on something from years ago working with uh, Dr. Dave Cole. We came up with something called the HUT principle. And it was just simply the abbreviations for hear what is said make sure you hear it understand what was meant and then take the appropriate action so hear understand take the action and yes you're exactly right tori if if they start talking and ratios and everything don't just sit there and shake your head head and say oh yeah yeah stop what does this mean mm -hmm. you know what are my alternatives how does it in, uh, affect me from that standpoint and then the second thing you was talking about having those thorough balance sheets. That's something, you know, as the managed team, 
all of us. And I guess I didn't even introduce myself who I was. I'm on, I'm Tori Marshall and I'm a farm management specialist out in West Tennessee. So Alan and Kevin are in middle Tennessee and I'm in West Tennessee. The managed team, that is our goal is to help you with these, whether it's a budget for your operation or helping you create that balance sheet for your farm, we're able to sit down with you and you can take those paperwork to your lenders and show them what we've kind of worked on and help with that. We offer that to any producer with here in the state of Tennessee. Those are two things that I took from that. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, Tori, we know from our Master Farm Manager program, the first thousand plus people that went through that program, when they answered the pre-program uh, survey, only 40% of them indicated they had an up-to-date current balance sheet. So again, it's one of those things that a lot of times, unless someone may be applying for a loan, that they need that up-to-date balance sheet, they don't keep it up-to-date from year to year. And this is another thing that you could see the benefit from. And we always have mentioned in several of these recordings that, you know, when things get a little tough, everybody seems to want to focus on more management planning during that time. But planning during the good times really can help you kind of work your way through the more difficult times. Absolutely. And that's what, you know, you've got three people right here on this discussion that I think could go all day long on this topic about things. But what I take away from this is that number one, for tax implications, Alan, we've got to make sure that we're utilizing the correct forms when we're talking about selling equipment or bringing livestock, having different types of income that we would normally have on the farm, correct? Absolutely. And and come to think of it, if, if folks need uh, more information, we do have a publication out there, uh, publication D42, that's uh, livestock sales, understanding the tax imp impl impacts of that. So if you've got a tax preparer that doesn't understand that those breeding livestock goes on 47.97, or, or you just want to make sure they understand, you can print that off from our website. And it's, it's a little three page publication that just kind of clears up how all that works. And it's got some good examples on it too. Absolutely. And it is a great resource when you're trying to understand and navigate these and it is these confusing situations it's a great resource to have mm -hmm. and then for kevin's conversation on lender relationships communication don't surprise them talk to them before we get in those tight spots kevin do you have anything you want to add as the focal point i think that's that's the key to the entire thing i would say you know i've mentioned this before and alan and i we started to work with this in the 80s you know we started in 86 there's been these difficult times before, and we've mentioned this, you know, there's other farmers that's been through these tough times. And a lot of that is just communication, you know, reach out, talk to someone, you know, give them, let's look at our alternatives, you know, that you have there. And I guess I would touch back on the, the information about the taxes. It's not just the recording for taxes. It's also, we need to go back and make sure we're keeping those records separated in our record keeping system because so many people i think where the challenge is sometimes if someone is just keeping records on a spreadsheet for example everything just gets thrown into a column called cattle sales and then if they just take that to some tax preparer they will just take that total and enter it on schedule f ordinary income and not ask that question where some of these cat or cattle sales breeding stock and that's when so if we uh, do that i think the focus needs to be also on the record keeping side as well we've got to keep that information separated to start with that makes everything a lot easier absolutely but there's been a lot of information thrown here today we hope that we've been able to provide an answer for some people when they're trying to navigate these please there's been a lot of topics hit today culling or destocking the herds. We also have additional videos in our library for this series, emergency culling strategies during drought. We've got one for beef cattle and dairy cattle that's available. Please go check it out if that's something you're interested in. Another one that Kevin and I were on was navigating inflation and family living expenses. You know, all of these things kind of tie in together in some way. Please check out those other videos. We thank y'all for joining us for this session. Kevin Allen, 
thank you so much for providing this information to producers and hopefully we can be able to help them in some way. Thanks, Tori. Thank you.